When you first started that video, Mike, I thought, what kind of music are we looking at? <laughs> <clears throat> I had a good visit with Mike the other day in the hospital. He's a fun fellow to talk to, by the way. And uh, he's doing a little bit better after his surgery. Uh, Wayne and Wallace said, oh, that's a hard thing to break. Wayne and Jonita are uh, a little down this morning. Uh, he called me yesterday and said they probably wouldn't be able to make it. So remember them in your prayers. And Anita's been up in San Francisco at a conference when she comes back this afternoon. And I almost got the house cleaned up. <laughs> Did get all the laundry done. No living person had seen what John had witnessed. He was a young man when he met Jesus years earlier. While John was mending fishing nets with his brother James, Jesus passed by their boat and invited them to follow him. And the next three years were world whirlwind. John experienced miracles that would become legendary. He learned from the greatest teacher in history. His companions were the future apostles of the church. His closest friend was the Son of God. Much had happened in John's life since the heady days when he was the Messiah's companion. John had become a beloved apostolic, apostolic father of the early church. He performed miracles and preached countless sermons. Tradition claims he served for a time at the church in Ephesus. John received word on ten different occasions that one of his fellow disciples, apostles, had been martyred. Along with them, great saints such as Stephen and James, the brother of Jesus, and, and the mighty apostle Paul had met cruel deaths in Christ's service. Now an old man, only John remained of the original apostles. Eventually, the authorities came for him too. Under the Roman emperor Diocletian, pressure was mounting against the church. The aged apostle was exiled to the island of Patmos, 60 miles southwest of Ephesus. And there he waited not only to learn of his own faith, but to also hear news from the beloved churches. In the quiet and, and solitude of his exile, one day John was startled by a loud voice that pierced the air like a trumpet. On the Lord's day, he said, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And John turned around to see who was speaking. And, and this is what he saw. He says, when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a long robe with a gold sash wrapped around his chest. His, his ear, hair were fire like wool, white as snow, his eyes like a fiery flame, his feet like fine bronze fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. In his right hand he had seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was shining like the sun in day. And John was so overwhelmed with the sight of the risen Christ that he fell to the ground as if he were dead. Though John had spent more than three years in Jesus' company, and despite the fact that he had subsequently served him for all these many decades, the awesome sight of the exalted Christ terrified the veteran apostle. And in the response, the Lord laid his right hand upon his faithful servant and declared, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. The living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades, the secret of the seven stars you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The exalted Christ had an inspiring message for the elderly disciple and the churches under his care. Christ walked among the seven lampstands. The lampstands represented the seven churches of, of Asia. The Son of Man held the angels of the churches in his immensely powerful right hand. I believe the angels of the churches were the pastors. How comforting to know that the Alpha and the Omega, the one who owns the keys to death and Hades, holds pastors firmly in his grip. Though the church's enemies might, might try their worst, Christ stood triumphantly among his churches, 
No words could be more comforting to a persecuted church than that Christ, the victor over every enemy of humanity, stood among them and held their pastor in his hand. He says in verse 4, But I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember how far you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove the lampstands from its place unless you repent. Perhaps the church in Jerusalem had received as much from God as had the church in Ephesus. The apostle Paul had established it and spent three years teaching and preaching in Ephesus. In Acts 20, verse 31, he said, For three years I did not cease to warn you night and day with tears. God worked powerfully through Paul's ministry, performing numerous miracles and casting out many demons. In addition to Paul, many other church leaders had ministered in Ephesus. Apollos, that, that famed order, preached in the city. Priscilla and Aquila ministered there as did Silas, Luke, Tychicus, Timothy, and John. When churches are given much, God expects much from them in return. God obviously had a special purpose for the Ephesians since he generously provided them with many of the finest leaders and teachers of that day. Ephesus was a major city in the Roman Empire, a prosperous seaport, a, a hub for international trade. It also boasted one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Diana. This major center of pagan idolatry dominated the local commerce and the loyalty of its citizens. The city also uh, housed the temple to Emperor Diocletian, motivating the Ephesians to prove their loyalty to the Roman Empire and his designs, even if that involved persecuting the church that had been created by God. From Ephesus, one could easily travel throughout the province of Asia. While Paul was in Ephesus, the church may have sent out church planters throughout the region. Clearly, it was a strategic location for the spread of the gospel. The, the Christians in Ephesus did many things well. They tested those who called themselves apostles and exposed the charlatans. They also despised the heretical teachings of the Nicolaitans. Having been instructed by teachers such as Paul and Timothy and John, their doctrine remained orthodox. And they also refused to tolerate evil. The church continued to labor, persevere, and endure trials such as the esteemed apostle John's arrest. And for the most part, the church's behavior was admirable. The church of Ephesus must have been gratified to hear Christ comment, commend them for so many behaviors, but devastated when he declared, I have this against you. How sublime it is when Christ has no caveats in his evaluation of a church or an individual. However, it is foolish to assume we can tolerate one sin as long as the majority of our activities are praiseworthy. It takes only one sin to be deserved of judgment. Again in verse 4, he said, you've abandoned the love you had at first. Christ had called the Ephesian church into a personal, loving relationship with himself. He does so with every church that calls him Lord and Savior. Nothing is more important than that. Uh, he had a solid, they had a solid list of exceptional behavior. But there was this one big shortcoming. One sin negated everything that was praiseworthy for they had neglected what was most important. They were still working for Christ, but they were no longer devoted to Him. They had once been, but no more. They no longer loved the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength. So what's the answer to this loss of love? He says in verse 5, Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent. And do the works you did at first. Otherwise I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now is that too harsh? Well, the church's conduct was generally admirable. But Christ will not tolerate a church that forgets its purpose. 
A church that forfeits its highest calling is in danger not only of losing its way, but more importantly of suffering God's judgment. The church at Ephesus had no time to lose. It needed to return wholeheartedly to the Lord. Despite its fidelity to proper doctrine, the Ephesian church was unacceptable to God. Clearly, even the most influential churches in the world can lose their way also. Jesus, Paul declared in Colossians 1.18, He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. The first purpose of the church is to glorify God. The Apostle Paul declared in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in you, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. The ultimate purpose of every Christian is to glorify God. There's no higher calling. Some churches focus on what they believe. Sound doctrine is important. But scripture teaches that faith and doctrine, apart from God, glorifying action is dead. The keys to glorifying God are first, to love God. And secondly, to serve God. God's way. God's ways are different from our ways. It's possible to do a good deed and yet dishonor God in the process. Are we bringing glory to God by our actions? Because if not, repentance is in order. If we're not exalting Christ by our behavior, we may, we may have lost our reason to exist. A second purpose of the church is to make disciples throughout the world. Jesus' final command was this, go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. God's, God's will is crystal clear. Churches are not simply to make converts, they're to make disciples. Disciples are not people who merely believe in Christ, these are people who follow Christ. Disciples are committed to doing everything Christ commanded Churches are called to reach out worldwide, not just to their own zip code. And, and we're called upon to preserve and bless our community. Jesus commanded his disciples to be salt and light wherever they went. In Jesus' day, without refrigeration now, meat and other foods would quickly spoil. Salt prevented valuable food items from rotting. Likewise, Jesus said Christians are to act as a preserving agent for their communities. Sin naturally tears down marriages, families, economics, societies. Righteousness will sustain them and protect people from the ravages of evil. Scripture tells us that the evil in the world is darkness. Jesus entered the world as light. To cast out darkness from the earth. Evil constantly strives to, to snuff out the light and leave the world in shadows. Yet, whenever a light shines brightly, darkness disappears. Jesus told believers, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify my Father in heaven. The book of Revelation portrays churches as golden lampstands. And some of those lampstands were beginning to flicker and go out. They had let darkness overtake them. God expects us to be a positive difference in the world. When God sent word to the Israelites who had been exiled to Babylon, He urged them, Seek the welfare of the city I have departed you to. In other words, where you're living now. Pray to the Lord on its behalf for when it has prosperity, you will prosper. In Proverbs, Solomon counsels us, when righteousness thrive, a city rejoices. There are churches that shut down today and their community would never know they were gone. Nothing in the neighborhood or city would change. And that's tragic. 
God intends for local churches to be such a blessing to their community that even unbelievers would be sad if they were ever to relocate or close their doors. So what's going to be the cure? For the Ephesians, Christ said, make three changes. First of all, remember how far you've fallen. We sometimes have no concept of how far we've drifted. Remember what your love and zeal were at first and return to that zeal and love again. I remember when HBO first came out. We didn't subscribe to it. We didn't need that in the house with two young boys growing up. We still don't subscribe to it. Because those are the kind of influences that come and enter and enter and do exactly this, cause people to drift from the center, from Christ. Secondly, Jesus said, repent. The Ephesians were so busy serving God that they didn't have time to love Him with all of their hearts, with all of their souls, and with all of their strength. The only remedy for sin is repentance. You've got to love God first. And finally, they were to do the works they did at first. They needed to return to service for God performed out of love and devotion to Christ and for no other reason, no other purpose. A change in action would indicate a change in heart. If your behavior does not change, you have not truly repented regardless of what you claim. The risen Christ walks today among today's churches. Our church. His fiery eyes look upon our congregation. He sees past our activities, our programs, our doctrines, straight into our hearts. Are you as devoted to Him today as you once were? Have you kept your focus on your divine purpose as God's people? Is the community around us being changed for good by our presence? Or would they hardly ever notice if we were gone? Harsh words from your word, Heavenly Father. Harsh words from our Savior for us to ponder and consider. We see what Christ has purposed for our church. We may have some idea now, perhaps how far we have fallen, how far away we have drifted from your purpose for our church on this hillside in Pacific Beach. May we, Heavenly Father, regain a true devotion to Christ and love and glorify you so that it can be the number one focus of our lives, of our hearts, in the days of our end. May we ponder the words of our Savior.
this is God's purpose for his church. Will you be a part of that? I'll stand at the front and wait. If there's those who respond, please come and share.